Religion has profoundly influenced the sweeping American narrative, perhaps more than any other force in our history, from the time before European colonization to the present. The startup National Museum of American Religion is working to build a museum in the nation's capital that will share the story of what religion has done to America and what America has done to religion, inviting all to explore the role of religion in shaping the social, political, economic, and cultural lives of Americans, and thus America itself. Join our host, Chris Stevenson, for season two of our podcast series, Religion in the American Experience, as we follow scholars deep into America's religious history and learn how it can inform and animate us as citizens grappling with complex questions of governance and American purpose in the 21st century. Episodes will be released every Monday on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Register for notifications on our website, www.storyofamericanreligion.org, under the sign-up tab. The civil rights movement is important to America and it's important to Americans at this point in our national history. The story itself and the reception of the story is complex, nuanced, messy, profound, compelling, sad, joyful, hopeful, and despairing. The civil rights movement story is inextricably linked to black slavery, what some call one of America's two original sins. A good way to better understand any event or movement in history and what it importantly projects onto the present is to focus on individual actors on history's stage. The name Fannie Lou Hamer will most likely not be familiar to most of our listeners. She was one of these larger-than-life actors in the civil rights movement whose story has slipped from the memory of the nation. For the purposes of this podcast series, we want to know about her religious thought and how it motivated and animated her fight for full civil rights for black Americans in the mid-20th century. To do this, we have with us today Megan Parker Brooks, Associate Professor in the Department of Civic Communication and Media at Willamette University, and author of several books and other media about the life and times of Fannie Lou Hamer, including Fannie Lou Hamer, America's Freedom Fighting Woman, and the children's book, Planting Seeds, The Life and Legacy of Fannie Lou Hamer. She received her Ph.D. from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2009 and is a teacher-scholar working at the intersections of rhetoric, race, and public memory. Today's episode will help us better understand what religion has done to America and what America has done to religion. And we trust that as a result, listeners will see how indispensable the idea of religious freedom as a governing principle is to the United States and its ability to fulfill its purposes in the world. We encourage our listeners to visit storyofamericanreligion.org and register for future podcast notifications under the sign up tab. Megan, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to talking with you about Mrs. Hamer. Megan, first, um, you write that Mrs. Hamer's life story is, quote, vivid, inspirational, and harrowing, close quote. How did you become interested in Fannie Lou Hamer to the extent that you have become quite an expert and dedicated to preserving and sharing her life story, including her work, which continues today? Yeah. Yeah, I, I can vividly remember the first uh, time I learned about Fannie Lou Hamer, um, and I um, maybe it won't come as a surprise to many of your listeners that it wasn't until I was well into my graduate program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I was taking a class on gender and the civil rights movement. We read Chana Kylie's uh, fantastic biography of Hamer, uh, and I... Um, I couldn't believe that I had been studying communication, rhetoric, American public discourse for years at that point. And I didn't know anything about Fannie Lou Hamer, someone who, um, you know, whose discourse was so powerful that the president of the United States, Lyndon B. Johnson, um, interrupted one of her uh, most famous speeches. Um, and so then and there in that classroom, you know, on my way home that evening, 
I had this idea that, um, you know, somebody should go around the United States and um, find these speeches, transcripts of these speeches, recordings, um, talk with people who had heard her speak um, as her biographers had chronicled um, and gather those into a collection of speeches. At that point, there were only three or four of Hamer's speeches published. Um, and so that sort of seed of an idea became my dissertation project. And um, at that moment, I had no way of knowing that Fannie Lou Hamer often traveled to Madison, Wisconsin, where I was studying, um, that there were people, you know, well into their 80s who knew her, who listened to her, who actually taped and kept her recordings of speeches that she gave in, in small churches and classrooms there um, in Madison. So it turns out I was in a really great place to begin um, that research. But, um, you know, that was really the moment for me um, and, and really began this uh, trajectory of Fannie Lou Hamer research that's now spanned about 15 years. Okay. Well, that's a fantastic story. So you approach this not necessarily from the historical perspective, but from the communications and rhetoric perspective, mm -hmm. which is unique, I think. Well, before we, we talk more, uh, more or in detail about uh, Hamer, can you explain the, quote, national fable of the civil rights movement close quote, to us, because you frame your book about Mrs. Hamer as one that attempts to address this fable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I'll say that this idea is probably familiar to a lot of your listeners, but what I love about that phrase, National Fable of the Civil Rights Movement, um, that was coined by um, historian Jean Theo Harris um, in her recent book, uh, it really puts language around uh, what I think many of us suspect, um, which is that the story of the civil rights movement um, in the last 50 or 60 years has been become largely flattened. Um, some would say it's been whitewashed. Um, the radical nature of the activism has largely been papered over. Um, it's become a tale um, that is situated in history and doesn't always draw out contemporary parallels. And in fact, a lot of times it denies those contemporary parallels. Um, so it's often told, and then I'm thinking in, you know, large public remembrances um, as a story where a few larger than life leaders, and I'm sure your listeners can sort of tick those people off, right? Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, you know, did extraordinary things and they made this progress and now we have moved past that, right? We're this post-racial society. And I think for me, you know, one of the reasons why I was so motivated to travel around the country and gather up Hamer's speeches and really listen to what she had to say is her story and the way that she tells her story challenges this fable of the civil rights movement. The issues that she was grappling with during her lifetime, you know, things like police brutality, um, voter disenfranchisement, disparities in terms of health um, and income, uh, these are things that we're still grappling with today, right? And so a lot of Hamer's words are just as relevant in our 2020 context as they were in 1964 and five when she first started, you know, speaking on the public stage. And so yes, I, I use this frame of the fable of the civil rights movement. And I argue much like you did in the introduction that if we focus on telling complex, fuller, robust histories of individuals who, who contributed to change, but who are also relatable, right? There's a lot about Fannie Lou Hamer's life story that I think many of your listeners, you know, myself included, can identify with and relate to. She doesn't seem um, so uh, larger than life that we couldn't imagine ourselves also contributing to change in our communities in, in, the, right. in the many of the creative ways that she did. I'm very humbled by her accomplishments, but I also see the way in which she could empower people in our contemporary context. And so I believe stories like that really puncture, um, trouble this uh, convenient history that you know makes us feel good about ourselves and denies the work that remains uh, right. in our culture. All right. Thank you. That's helpful as we move forward and move through these questions. Um, as I said in the introduction, for our purposes, what we want to draw out um, along the road of understanding who, who she was and what she did is her, her religious motivations, which, as I read the book, were very uh, profound for her and I think will be um, are, are definitely an integral part of her story, and she was very open about that. So 
I'm excited to talk about those things. Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer's mother, Lou Ella, so now we're going to uh, start in on the questions about uh, her and her life, told her once, her mother told her once when she was a young child in response to Fannie Lou Hamer's complaining about the inequality she saw as a young person between whites and blacks in her small town, uh, her mother said, quote, be grateful that you are black. If God had wanted you to be white, you would have been white. So you accept yourself for what you are and you respect yourself as a black child, close quote. Um, Megan, can you give us a short biography of Hamer, her growing up in her early adult years, bringing us up to just before that mass meeting in August of 1962? This will be helpful to our listeners. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, um, you know, Fannie Lou Hamer was born the 20th child to sharecropper parents, James Lee and Lou Ella Townsend. She was born in Montgomery County, Mississippi, and the family moved when she was about two years old um, to a plantation outside of Ruleville, Mississippi in the Delta. Um, at the time, Ruleville was uh, the epicenter of the um, worldwide cotton industry. It was one of the most productive um regions of the country and our country was one of the uh, most productive regions in the world in terms of producing cotton. Um, so her family became sharecroppers on um, uh, E.W. Brandon's plantation out about four miles east of the city center of Ruleville. Um, she herself was uh, tricked into um, the plantation owner's debt through treats that he enabled her to get from his commissary, commissary store. So she actually started picking cotton at the age of six, six years old, um, to pay off those debts from, you know, candy and things that he let her take from the store. It's a really, you know, heart-wrenching story about her early, um, you know, en en enlistment into sharecropping. Uh, she did attend school. Um, she learned to read very well. She had a, um, a teacher she called Professor Thornton Lane, um, who was a bit of a character. She remembered him fondly. She learned to, to read and write and recite poetry um, in the one-room schoolhouse that he led. But she did have to leave school at the age of 12 um, to help her aging parents um, and help earn money for the family to make ends meet in this really exploitative sharecropping system. Um, as she went, grew up in age, so into her 20s, many of her brothers and sisters, her older brothers and sisters left the Mississippi Delta as part of the Great Migration. So they left to northern cities in search of you know, better jobs, a better life. Um, she stayed and she cared for her aging parents. Uh, her mother, Luella, uh, was blinded by an accident where she was clearing brush. Um, and so she really required Fannie Lou Hamer's help. Um, Hamer met uh, Perry Hamer, who was a tractor driver and a sharecropper at a neighboring plantation. And she and her mother moved uh, from E.W. Brandon's plantation to W.D. Marlowe's plantation. Um, and she earned a position of privilege on um, that plantation. She, she was recognized for her leadership abilities, um, her reading and writing skills, and and so she became the timekeeper on the plantation. So she worked with the landowner, but in her, um, you know, resistive capacity that she had at that point in her life, she would work to give sharecroppers um, a fair uh, accounting, a fair earning for their harvest. Whereas when the plantation owner was weighing the cotton that they brought in, he would use a weighted scale to cheat them out of um, money for their uh, work. And so she was you know, trying to balance the scales there on the plantation far before she became uh, invested in the movement. Uh, into the 1960s, she and uh, Perry Hamer were entrusted with two daughters from their community whose families were not able to raise them. And I think that's really a testament to the respect that people in the community had for the Hamers. And so Fannie Lou Hamer was raising two young children, caring for her mother, working as a sharecropper. She also, as I said, was the timekeeper. She would commonly um, be called on to clean the plantation owner's home. Um, and, and it was in that post that she learned 
learned um, about the fact that she'd been given a forced hysterectomy uh, without her consent or knowledge. So she um, had a uterine tumor that she went in to get removed and the doctor um, sterilized her uh, without her consent or knowledge. And she found out about that through rumors that were floating around the plantation owner's house. Um, and she actually confronted that doctor and this happened in 1961. Uh, it was so common in the state of Mississippi, in fact, to forcibly sterilize uh, poor women, women of color, that it was called a Mississippi appendectomy. Uh, but she knew she had no recourse, and this really frustrated her. And she started to say things to those around her, really anyone who would listen, that if she could just find a way to change things, like she recognized how unjust these systems were, and if she could just find a way to really speak out against them, um, she would jump at that opportunity. And then that opportunity came um, in the form of this mass meeting in 1962. That's super helpful. Megan, you write about Mrs. Hamer's father, Reverend Townsend, and his stranger's home Baptist church becoming her, quote, sole source of formal learning, close quote, and that the church, quote, provided a training ground for her eventual activism, close quote. Can you elaborate a bit on this, including where the song fits in that made her famous? Yeah, absolutely. So um, this was something that uh, was very um, generative for me to learn about through the interviews that I did with Hamer's friends and family and, and many fellow activists. So um, I learned that the church really became the place where Hamer honed her activist skills that she would then transfer to the movement. So um, being the daughter of a Black Baptist minister, um, hearing her father deliver the word from the pulpit, you know, puts Hamer in a, a relatively common category with many civil rights activists, right? So this was King's story, right? This was John Lewis's story and others. Um, and she learned from her father how to connect biblical stories stories, right? Like the Exodus narrative, the story of the Israelites bondage in Egypt um, and, and the resistance to that becoming a chosen people. She learned about that parallel um, as her father would connect it to the experience of Black people in America from, from the pulpit. So she learned about that. She learned about scripture um, that connected to the uh, agrarian experience, experience of, of sharecropping, thinking about, you know, herbs withering um, and, you know, do not fret uh, evildoers, they will be cut down and wither as the, the herb, right? So she would she would learn about these biblical parallels from her father, you know, in terms of content. She was also learning um, about style, how to deliver a message in this call and response format that really enlisted the audience into the learning, the sort of co-learning that they were doing um, during the church experience. She talked about um, the Black church as one of the few places if, if not the only place that Black people in her community had that they could really call their own, right? It was a place where they could exercise, you know, their freedom of thought, their freedom of expression. And so, you know, she learned about how to deliver an engaging sermon, um, which served her very well when she started working for the movement. Um, and, and last, I'll say that she also learned the power of song. Um, she really found her beautiful contralto voice uh, singing in the church. Her father would commonly call upon her uh, to sing songs. And so when she transferred this, these ideas to the movement, she would take hymns like Go Tell It on the Mountain and This Little Light of Mine, and she would change some of the verses to reflect the contemporary situation um, that Black people were struggling with in Mississippi or in other areas of the United States, depending where she was speaking, um, to give them renewed significance um, and salience. Okay. So uh, I'd like to play um, the this little light of mine, uh, her version of it. And I, I just would be great if your listeners could think about the, how the call and response is even working um, within this song, right? So like how she's functioning as a song leader and inviting the participation, you know, kind of think about this as like empowerment, right? Um, through the very nature of, of the way that she's leading the song okay. itself. So I'll just play a, a clip of uh, her version of this little light of mine. It's the light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, it's the 
stop there and just, um, you know, point out uh, the way in which she's inviting, you know, participation along with her through that repetition and changing the lyrics um, from, uh, you know, I've got the light of freedom, I'm going to let it shine. And I, you know, I think that really speaks to the way she saw herself as called um, by God to do this work, right? Feeling like voter registration, advocacy, you know, was akin to um, proselytizing as a form of uh, doing God's work and, and, as she would say, fulfilling God's word um, on this earth. Okay, great. That was wonderful to hear that. Thank you for sharing that. Megan, tell us the story of the August 27, 1962 mass meeting at Williams Chapel Baptist Church, including the sermon, and why 44-year-old Fannie Lou Hamer was moved by all this. Yeah, um, you know, this is one of those defining moments in Hamer's life, right? So when I was sharing a bit about her biography and sort of ending with uh, this meeting, um, it, it was this confluence of events that led to uh, Hamer's uh, activist career, really the origin of her activist career. So she was becoming, you know, increasingly dissatisfied with uh, her experiences in uh, the Mississippi Delta. She wanted to speak out about things like like the forced sterilization, right? Like the economic exploitation that she was seeing um, happen day in and day out uh, on the plantation, but she didn't see any, you know, mechanism or way to um, speak out about this. Um, so about that time, um, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was traveling throughout the South, and they were. Um, propagating or um, encouraging this new form of civic activism among um, the masses of Black people in places like the Mississippi Delta, um, where Black people outnumbered whites by a considerable margin. Um, so rather than as the NAACP had for generations or going into the Black middle and upper classes and um, encouraging voters among, you know, teachers and preachers and people who were, um, you know, well established in their communities, that was a bit more of the NAACP peace strategy for Black civic engagement. Um, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, led by Bob Moses and others in the state, had this idea that they wanted to go into churches and pool halls and juke joints and empower the masses of Black people um, who had been left out of a lot of these previous campaigns. So it was part of that strategy coming into um, rural Mississippi, coming into the Mississippi Delta, coming into her church um, for a mass meeting that brought Hamer um, into the fold of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So she was even skeptical going into this meeting. Um, one of her friends who she really loved and respected encouraged her um, to try to come. So she came uh, and she listened to the messages and James Bevel of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, he was a trained uh, Black Baptist theologian and Mississippi native, and he delivered a sermon called Discerning the Signs of the Time. And he was riffing on um, the uh, section of the Bible where, um, you know, Jesus uh, says to the scribes and the Pharisees, you know, how is it that you don't recognize me as the Messiah, right? So how do you not see what is before you um, and recognize these signs? And Bevel took that idea and transferred it to um, contemporary United States, uh, pointing out things like freedom rides, right, and sit-ins, um, and you know, the Brown versus Board of Education decision the things that were happening around Mississippi and around the country um, that signaled a change in the times, right? And he invited the people seated before him to become a part of that change, to recognize the signs of the time. Um, he even, you know, used references to uh, the clouds. You can see the change in weather and predict that there will be rain. How can you not see these signs of the time, right? So, so pulling that um, th those uh, ideas through from uh, the Bible. And so this really resonated with Hamer, right? So this was, you know, speaking her language and it, and it really resonated with her. And then James Foreman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee followed up Bevel's sermon with um, a brief civic education lesson, you know, telling people um, seated before him, Black people, you know, day labor, sharecroppers, that they had a constitutionally um, protected right to vote, that they had this right, um, and that they 
could exercise it. Um, and then this is how we'll go down to, you know, the county seat and we'll register at the courthouse um, on Friday. And it was followed up with this altar call, right? Um, you know, who would like to come uh, do this on Friday? And Hamer was one of the first people to raise her hand and say, yep, she was going to try to vote um, on that Friday, uh, along with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. You know, some of your listeners might be thinking like, oh, okay, you know, go down to the, the county courthouse and register to vote. You know, why did it require a sermon? Why did it require a civic education lesson? Um, and the context here is really key, right? So Hamer, um, from, you know, generations back, she's the granddaughter of an enslaved person. She'd been living in this tightly controlled uh, plantation environment where people who tried to speak up, people who tried to challenge the exploitative nature of sharecropping were lynched, right? There, Joe Pullum is someone she often references, who is a person who stood up to the landowner who demanded pay for adequate pay for um, his labor and a lynch mob came after him and they you know not only uh, through a, a drawn out altercation um, killed Joe Pullum but then they uh, the the lynchers did horrific things like um, preserve his earlobe in a drugstore um, that black people frequented as this intimidating sign they, they drug his body through the town right I mean there, there were horrific examples examples made of people who stood up against white supremacy. So the idea of going down to the courthouse and demanding one's right to vote um, was frightening. It was frightening to the people that, that were gathered there. And Foreman and Bevel knew this, and they knew that they needed to um, not only persuade people uh, to try this, but support them along the way. So, you know, Hamer's act of raising her hand and indicating her willingness was a very brave act um, in 1962 in the Mississippi. Delta. Right. Well, why don't you uh, tell us the story of what happened on Friday, and I'll, I'll just, um, let me quote something you wrote uh, that Fannie Lou Hamer did uh, when she was so fearful, but then, uh, and that's sometime in, in the latter part of the story, but I want to read this and then have you tell us what happened that day. On the way home from registering to vote unsuccessfully, uh, you write that Fannie Lou Hamer's, quote, strong voice belied her tangled stomach, but she summoned the power of gospel music and sang all the way home, close quote. Uh, Megan, tell us what happened that day and the ramifications. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Bevel and Foreman were not expecting that 18 people would have come down for the, you know, their version of an altar call, raise their hand, indicate their willingness to vote. So they actually weren't prepared to transport, you know, 18 uh, Black Deltons to Indianola, which is about 26 miles away. Uh, so they had to find... Um, a, a, an old bus that was used to transport migrant workers um, uh, to and from Mississippi to Florida. So they actually, they use this old bus um, from someone in the community who was supportive of their efforts. Um, and they drove 18 people from Rollville to Indianola. And, you know, on the way there, um, you know, Hamer reflects a bit about being hopeful. Uh, one of the things that Foreman talked about in his um, address uh, at the church was that through the vote, Black Deltons could change the power structure of their community, right? They could vote out racist sheriffs, for example. So, you know, it's, it's likely that Hamer was hopeful. She also um, packed a, a pair of comfortable shoes, she remembers and writes, because she thought and, and she was told that they could be arrested for this. And so she, you know, wanted to make sure she was prepared um, in that case. So they drove to Indianola. When they arrived, um, the courthouse was uh, lined with citizens council members. So white men with um, shotguns and dogs. Um, and initially they didn't understand, you know, who are all these people standing outside the courthouse and until they realized that that act of a bus full of black people um, had got the word out to the community. They'd been followed there um, by citizens council members and the Citizens Council, if some of your readers or, or listeners, excuse me, are unfamiliar, um, was commonly referred to as the Klan in suits, not sheets. So this was the quote unquote respectable Klan uh, in Mississippi. And they were there to intimidate uh, the would-be voters um, who were scared now to even get off the bus, right, to go into the courthouse. 
Hamer was one of the first people who uh, went into the courthouse and sort of summoned that strength. And she was you know, flanked and supported by members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. When they arrived into the courthouse, um, the registrar uh, told them that they had to you know, come back in two at a time and they had to take this test that was designed to um, bar their civic assertion, right? It wasn't a test that was you know, going to reward their competence. They couldn't study for it. She had to interpret an obscure passage from uh, the Mississippi uh, state constitution to the satisfaction of the registrar. So all 18 of the would-be registrants failed their registration test um, and it took all day. So by late afternoon, they filed back onto the bus and they were headed home and everyone was discouraged, de de demoralized, frightened, right? Because they feared what would happen to them once they got home. Um, if this many you know, citizens counselors knew about their attempt to vote, would the plantation owners know about their attempt to vote, right? Um, and what would that mean for their lives and their livelihood? So they were scared. And then, you know, a couple miles down the road, they got pulled over by a state highway patrolman. And the state highway patrolman went to arrest the bus driver. And his crime was driving a bus that was too yellow, a bus that too closely resembled a school bus. Uh, and the rest of the people on the bus said, if you're going to arrest him, you'll have to arrest all of us. Um, and so this was more than the highway patrolman was prepared for. So he said, well, I'll fine you $100. And they couldn't gather $100. No one had you know $100 between all of them, but they did manage to gather $30, which he took um, and they headed home. And Hamer during this time um, really emerges as a community leader uh, because she she starts singing gospel songs, um, walk with me, O Lord, right, as I'm on this Jesus journey, uh, to help comfort the people on the bus, right, to help remind them of the importance of what they were doing, even in light of their failed attempt, and to help you know, strengthen their resolve to go home and face whatever awaited them uh, once they returned. Is, it, is that when, if I remember correctly, she had to leave her home that night? Is it, or mm -hmm. that okay? So by the time Hamer returned to her, uh, the plantation where she lived and worked at W.D. Marlowe's plantation, uh, she heard right away from her daughter uh, and her daughter's uh, cousin, uh, Paps. Uh, uh, cousin, that um, she that the landowner had been um, quote raising Cain all day. He had got a call from the citizens council um, that she was down there trying to register, and he came storming up to her and said, "You know, uh, with you must withdraw your registration attempt, um, or you're going to have to leave this plantation." And he said, "Even if you do withdraw it, it's just how I feel. You might have to leave anyway. I'll come back in the morning for your answer." Um, but Hamer did not wait until the morning. Uh, she told him that she didn't go down there to register for him. She went down there to register for herself. And she knew that uh, she was now in danger and she needed to leave that night. Um, and so she left that evening. She left a home where she lived with her husband, her mother, her daughters um, for 18 years, where she'd served um, in this important role as a timekeeper, where she had, you know, baked goods for the plantation owner's son when he was away at war, right? I mean, this was a hard decision to make that evening, but she was fearful um, because of what she said, because of what she did, um, and how the landowner uh, and other citizens counselors might respond. So she moved in with a friend who had encouraged her uh, to come to the initial mass meeting in the first place. She moved in with Mary uh, and Robert Tucker, um, and she stayed there for a week or so until Perry Hamer, um, who was forced to stay on the plantation and finish the harvest or for forfeit all the family's belongings. Um, so he was, he and, and uh, her daughters were still on uh, W.D. Marlowe's plantation and he noticed um, buckshot shells uh, in um, the uh, machinery house. Um, and he was worried that those shells were intended for his wife um, and not any sort of hunting at that point in the season, right? This is August. And so he encouraged Hamer to take their children uh, to a faraway cabin. Uh, a cousin of uh, Perry Hamer lived in uh, the neighboring town of Cascilla and uh, in Tallahatchie County. And so uh, Hamer escaped um, from uh, the house where she was staying. And days later, in fact, 16 um, shots were fired into the bedroom where she had been sleeping um, just inches above her bed. Okay, thank you. Without a home, 
uh, people pooled their money and rented a home in Ruleville for the Hamers, which Fannie Lou Hamer took as a, quote, sign from God, close quote, the first time she had not lived on a plantation. Megan, you write this, um, quote, It's a funny thing since I w- started working for Christ, which is how Fannie Lou Hamer characterized her civil rights advocacy, close quote. Can you paint the full portrait of Mrs. Hamer and her religious motivations as she entered the realm of civil rights advocate here at age 44? Just give us a brief description of her sort of religious, her, the portrait of her religiously as she embarks on this that will define her life for the rest of her life. Yeah, yeah. So I want to play a a quote from her here. This is um, from her first uh, sermon that we have on record. So this was her um, telling this, uh, you know, in response to your question, you know, telling uh, the audience gathered before her about how she'd been called from God um, to do this civil rights work. And so we'll, we'll just take a listen to that. From the fourth chapter of St. Luke beginning at the 18th verse. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken heart, to preach deliverance to the captive and recover the sight to the blind, to set at liberty to them who are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now the time have come that was Christ's purpose on earth. And we only been getting by by paying our way to hell. But the time is out. When Simon Serene was helping Christ to bear his cross up the hill, he said, must Jesus bear this cross alone and all the world go free? He said, no, there's a cross for everyone, and there's a cross for me. This consecrated cross I'll bear till death shall set me free, and then go home a crown to wear, for there's a crown for me. And it's no easy way out. We just got to wake up and face it. And if I can face the issue, you can too. You see, the thing was so pitiful now about it. The men been wanting to be the boss all of these years. And the ones that ain't up under the house is under the bed. So you can hear there uh, this conviction, right, that she casts in biblical terms. She really felt that you know, the sign of SNCC and the SCLC coming into her community, the fact that she narrowly escaped death at the Tucker's home, um, the fact that then SNCC goes and finds her at this remote cabin and brings her um, into the civil rights work. And then when she returns from uh, a speaking and singing tour um, in the fall of 1962, SNCC um, is able to get her family a, a modest home in town. So the first time that her family lives off of a plantation, um, she knows the work is hard, right? She knows that firsthand, but she also feels like God is providing for her. um, And that's a sign to her that she should continue doing this work um, and encouraging others to do so as well. Okay. Profoundly moving. Uh, Megan, let's let's move on to Sunday, June 9th, 1963. uh, And the voices of 10 Black Passengers including that of uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, rose above the other bus travelers' chatter as they sang, Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain to let my people go. Who's that yonder dressed in red? Let my people go. Must be the children Bob Moses led. Let my people go. Close quote. Megan, can you give us a detailed description of who these people were, where they were going, and then what happened to them this being so critical to Fannie Lou Hamer's future advocacy. Yeah. Um, Yes. You know, and I will just um, warn your listeners that this is um, a a very traumatic story um, about what Hamer and her fellow civil rights workers endured on their way home from a civil rights workshop um, in South Carolina 
So they were returning from one of these workshops that was um, molded in the Highlander Folk School model of empowering local people through these sort of center people organizers, right? So they were chosen from their communities as leaders to attend um, the civil rights training session uh, to help uh, train other people to register and go out and vote. And the idea is that this could have a ripple effect within their communities, right? So they were returning from this. They, you know, had learned and shared in many of these uh, hymns turned movement anthems like the Go Tell It on the Mountain um, that you quote from there. Um, so they were singing these songs on the bus. And this was aggravating the white bus driver. And all along the way at each sort of continental trailway stop that they made, they saw him get off the bus and make phone calls, right? So they started to get suspicious that he would he was communicating with perhaps uh, the Citizens Council or perhaps um, local police who often were one and the same. A uh, couple stops from their final Greenwood, Mississippi destination. They get off in Montgomery County. They stop at a place called Staley's Cafe. Hamer actually decides to stay on the bus. A few people go into the counter um, and they try to be served, um, right? So they they know that they have a right because of the um, Interstate Commerce uh, Commission ruling in 1961 that they should be served um, as Black people at this counter, uh, but the white waitress refused to serve them. Um, there, uh, there starts to be a bit of a commotion and a police person, a policeman who I believe was called by the bus driver um, is there and suddenly there are many more policemen that kind of swarm this cafe. So the um, civil rights workers decide to just leave, try to get back on the bus on the way. And now Ponder, um, who was one of the organizers, starts to copy down um, the license plate tags of the police officers as they were trained to do so. And they were reporting these to uh, the Justice Department. Uh, the police officer sees her doing that and, and starts to arrest her and all the people with them. Hamer sees this commotion from the bus. She comes off and she asks, like, what should I do? Should I go on to Greenwood, right, and get help? Or, um, you know, like, what, what do I do here? She's asking in Ponder and Anel Ponder's trying to get her to go back on the bus, but she's spotted by one of the policemen and she's you know, roughly handled, kicked, um, uh, handcuffed, thrown into the back of a car. They're all bought, brought to uh, Montgomery County Jail in Winona, Mississippi. Um, they're all um, put into cells. Uh, and then over the course of that evening, they're um, subjected to horrific beatings um, and they can hear um, these beatings from their own cells. They, you know, are anticipating what's going to happen to them. Um, when Hamer endures this beating uh, from a, a blackjack, so a, a loaded, um, you know, both sides um, instrument that uh, the police officers in the cell um, ordered uh, other black prisoners who were there um, to to beat Hamer with, um, or else they would um, be, you know, shot. They, uh, the police officers sort of pointed to their guns when the Black prisoners refused to um, beat this elderly, you know, to them elder Black woman. Um, Hamer, in telling this story, often alludes to um, sexual abuse that she endured during this beating. She was trying to um, smooth her dress down. Her dress kept getting um, worked up. She was laying on a cot. She was forced to lay face down and her dress would work up and she would try and pull it down. Um, and that was angering the police officers um, who um, were forcing uh, the prisoners, one, to sit on her legs. They were holding her hands back and she felt um one of the police officers, she couldn't see who because her dress was over her face, um, feeling underneath her clothes during this time. Um, and eventually she uh, passed out from the abuse. Uh, and when she came to, she was being drugged back to her cell. Her cellmate um, uh, then was taken in and um, just before the cellmate started to um, receive similar treatment, um, a phone call came into the jail and um, they believe that phone call was from someone um, who the SNCC workers had contacted when these civil rights workers didn't return. And what ensued was, um, you know, the FBI came to the jail to interview uh, the civil rights workers 
members. There was coordination between Julian Bond of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, Martin Luther King Jr. of SCLC, um, and this went all the way up to uh, Attorney General at the time, Robert F. Kennedy, um, and on to J. Edgar Hoover. Um, there was a, the awareness that there were nine civil rights workers being held in this Winona, Mississippi jail cell, um, and that they were fearful that they would be killed. Um, and they were there for several days, four or five days. And Hamer believes the only reason why they were able to um, eventually secure their release, Ambassador Andrew Young, he was not an ambassador then, Andrew Young, civil rights worker Andrew Young, uh, Dorothy Cotton and James Bevel came to secure their release. Um, and, and they had the bail money sent from Martin Luther King Jr. and the SCLC to do so. But Hamer believes the only reason why they were able to be released to those civil rights workers uh, was because um, uh, Governor Wallace um, did his famous stand in the schoolhouse door in Alabama um, days before while they were in prison. And then Medgar Evers had just been assassinated on his front porch that or uh, front lawn early uh, that morning. And so they believe that um, Robert F. Kennedy, perhaps John F. Kennedy ordered um, them to be released. It was um, just this horrific confluence of events that were um, demonstrating the horrors of white supremacy across the nation. And they didn't want an additional um, horrific event like the, the killing of um, you know nine civil rights workers in a Mississippi jail cell um, to precipitate that uh, event. Even further. So they were released. Hamer um, and Nell Ponder and others spent months um, healing, uh, at first in, um, in Mississippi uh, in a hospital and then later transferred to Atlanta. Um, and she also flew to Washington, D.C. Um, not long after she met with King in Atlanta and the FBI um, investigated the case and, and brought a trial against uh, the white police officers. And that was one of the first times where white police officers were being held accountable um, for this. They, they were found not guilty in, in Oxford, Mississippi months later, but there was a, a trial brought against them. Hard to hear. Uh, before we leave this, I'm just going to read something you write. You write, um, quote, and this is about Fannie Lou Hamer's uh, um, regaining of, of her health. Uh, she, as you say, she did have months of, of medical assistance, but, but here you write, uh, when they were leaving, um, quote, sometime after midnight, Hamer's fever broke and she regained consciousness. Parting her cracked lips and breathing deeply in and out of her bruised diaphragm, a fellow activist remembered Hamer's low voice singing out, walk with me now, Lord, walk with me while I'm on this Jesus journey. I want Jesus to walk with me by my friend now, Lord, by my friend, make a way for me now, Lord, make a way for me. While I'm on this Jesus journey, I want Jesus to walk with me, close quote. And I think that is just um, indicative of, of sort of how she saw herself as a civil rights activist, as sort of working for Jesus himself. Megan, you write that uh, Hamer had come to see black political activism as divinely inspired. And you quote a Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party chair describing it this way later. Quote, Fannie Lou Hamer was a religious fanatic in the most positive sense. I heard her say, if I hate white people, I can't see the face of Jesus. So she was very anti-hate, very pro-nonviolent, and she took her religious beliefs and she parlayed them into politics, close quote. And you've commented on this, so we're not, we're not going to stay here uh, and discuss, but I just wanted to bring that out as something you wrote for our listeners to sort of continue to grasp the... Uh, who tried to understand who uh, Fannie Lou Hamer was and what motivated her uh, in what she did, which uh, that, that experience in Winona uh, really scarred her for life. Um, and uh, and uh, she often would refer to it. Um, and uh, it's, as I said, very difficult to hear. We are talking with Megan Parker Brooks, Associate Professor in the Department of Civic Communication and Media at Willamette University and author of several books and other media about the life and times of Fannie Lou Hamer, including Fannie Lou Hamer, America's Freedom Fighting Woman, and the children's book, Planting Seeds, The Life and Legacy of Fannie Lou Hamer. Megan, uh, we have about 15 minutes, uh, plus or minus. We need you to tell us the story about her 1964 speech to the Credentials Committee, and I think you have something to play from that, but if you can 
give us a little bit of background here, what she's doing, and then we'll hear that that excerpt. Sure. So um, the if your listeners do know about Fannie Lou Hamer, odds are they learned about her through this speech, right? This is her most famous address. Um, it was a speech that she gave to the Credentials Committee at the Democratic National Convention in 1964, and it was part of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party's larger strategy um, to unseat uh, the Mississippi regulars, as they were called, the Mississippi delegates who were sent from their state. Um, so the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party was formed out of Freedom Summer, so the larger um, SNCC SCLC uh, COFO initiative um, that had taken place throughout the summer of 1964. And it culminated um, in the this creation of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Uh, they were, um, they, they had followed all of the rules for organizing a political party. Um, they had sworn their allegiance to the Democratic Party and they had allowed, you know, people of all races to join. So they were contrasting that inclusive, inclusivity with the exclusivity of of the Mississippi Regular Party, who which was an all-white delegation that did not represent the state of Mississippi's constituents. And so they took this fight to um, the Democratic National Convention in Atlantic City, and there was a you know, multiple pronged lobbying effort. There were um, it was a 24-hour vigil on the Atlantic City boardwalk in which Hamer was um, singing. Uh, there were pictures of the civil rights workers, uh, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner, who had had uh, been murdered by Klansmen in Philadelphia, Mississippi for their civil rights work. Or work. Um, and there was lobbying efforts sort of behind the scenes trying to lobby credentials committee members. But the, um, the, the culminating event of this uh, culmination was uh, a, um, eight person uh, testimonies, uh, including the widow of uh, Michael Schwerner, Rita Schwerner Bender, Martin Luther King Jr., um, Roy Wilkins of the NAACP. There were really notable speakers on this panel that was testifying about the white supremacist terror in Mississippi that was keeping black people from voting. Um, but the most memorable of those um, speeches and those testimonies was Fannie Lou Hamer. So she spoke for about eight minutes. She shared the story that I shared with you all of her first registration attempt and what happened as a result. She shared the story of the beating in Winona, Mississippi, and that led to um, this climactic conclusion um, that I'll play for you here. Um, and then I'll talk about the uh, interruption that she endured. But let's let's listen to the conclusion of her testimony before the DNC. All of this is on account of we want to register to become first class citizens. And if the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to speak with our telephones off of the hook because our lives be threatened daily? because we want to live as decent human beings in America. Thank you. So not long after Hamer started delivering that address uh, before the Credentials Committee, 108 person committee, but also before the press, CBS, ABC, NBC were all there uh, rolling, right? It's about two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, President Johnson uh, had heard about Hamer. Um, he had heard about this challenge and he did not, not want anything interrupting what he saw as essentially his inauguration to this full second term that he was gonna have. So he called an impromptu press conference uh, to call the press tension away. And it was rumored that he was going to announce his running mate in this press conference. So the cameras followed him. And so we went from Atlantic City, uh, Hamer's uh, beginning of her address, to uh, the White House, to um, LBJ and what uh, news reporters thought was going to be an announcement of his running mate. Instead, it was like a non-announcement. He announced it was the nine-month anniversary um, of the assassination of JFK. So a nine-month anniversary of something is what he called uh, the reporters there to announce. And so they realized that they'd been duped, um, and they decided to replay Hamer's testimony um, on their nightly news program um, in prime time. <laughs> 
And so this way, Hamer was in, introduced to the American public, right? People seated, you know, in TV trays, eating dinner, you know, watching the convention saw Fannie Lou Hamer that night and telegrams of support poured into uh, the DNC for the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party um, and really forced Johnson to negotiate with the MFDP um, and uh, offer them a compromise, which, you know, Hamer rejected uh, outright. It was a really offensive compromise. Um, uh, but this was really the introduction of Hamer to uh, to the nation and um, has had long lasting effects. OK, thank you. And thank you for playing that. I want to jump uh, forward a little bit uh, to to uh, Malcolm X and Fannie Lou Hamer and, and sort of their interaction. Uh, Malcolm X called her, quote, America's number one freedom fighting woman, close quote. And you write that. Hamer nodded her head and raised her arms to the heavens when Malcolm talked about an enraged Jesus driving out the money changers, turning the tables over in the temple, and by the time it got to the revolutionary Jesus of Revelations, the Jesus whose patience ran out, Hamer was back on her feet shouting, tell it, close quote. Megan, can you talk to us about her relationship with this radical view of Christianity, and that's in quotes from your book, that Malcolm espoused and how it animated her work? Absolutely. So uh, I, I'm glad you asked this question because I think that um, part of that national fable of the civil rights movement maybe is a thinking that, um, you know, Christianity informed and infused this sort of um, kumbaya, let's all come together, let's all love one another, let's love our enemies. And Certainly, yes, there was a part of that, right? And Hamer was a warm, loving person. She was a person who forgave um, all manner of transgressions against her and who really believed in the power of moral suasion. And she believed this throughout her career. So she did not waver um, when SNCC activists did by the mid-1960s and, and expelled white people from their organization. She never wavered in believing that white people had a soul that they could be redeemed um, she she didn't she kept that she held fast to that. <clears throat> but that's not to say um, that she didn't believe that, as she would often say, Jesus was a revolutionary person. Jesus was out there with the poor and the disenfranchised, and he was on the side of the oppressed. Um, that Jesus was uh, was radical in nature. Like that's the that's the Jesus um, that she also exemplified in her activism, um, and she believed uh, not in the turn the other cheek um, ideology, but as she would say. Um, you know, there came a time uh, in the Bible when David had to slay Goliath, um, and, and she would, you know, draw that parallel that there was a time for self-defense, and there was a time for standing up um, for your rights, and she, you know, had loaded guns in her house because her house was, you know, often uh, firebombed, and there were, you know, citizen counselors and clan people who would drive by her house, so she believed in armed self-defense, and she believed in um, the radical power of um, of black activism, even as she um, was a devout Christian. Right. Thank you. Uh, that, I think that it is important to, to see and to understand. We don't have too much time, but let, let, let me ask a, a question or two about um, Fannie Lou Hamer's involvement in the National Women's Political Caucus, um, which participation you wrote Fannie Lou Hamer cast in biblical terms with an allusion to the book of Esther, and I'm going to quote here from her, quote, So I'm saying to you today, who knows but that I have come as to the kingdom for such a time as this, close quote. Can you share with us what she did in that caucus, what her influence was, including her approach to reproductive control, which she called the great sin, and why? This is a fascinating piece of American history and American religious history, I think, that we don't really know about. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, you know, in, in feminist history too, right? So um, Hamer was a founding member of the National Women's Political Caucus. She participated in the inaugural meeting. She spoke at that inaugural meeting and she called white feminists to task um, for trying to um, bring together women from different backgrounds under this banner of sisterhood before they dealt with the real divisions between women of different races. 
places, different classes, different life experiences, right? And so that's where we get that Ruth parallel that she's thinking about, or excuse me, that Esther parallel um, that you quoted from, right? So she's thinking about herself at this meeting, at this precipitous moment, right? This important moment, the founding of the National Women's Political Caucus, but she's not identifying wholeheartedly with a second wave feminist, right? And in some ways she's thinking about the need to protect her people, right? And acknowledge um, the lived experiences that they've endured, right? So, you know, part of what she talks about with reproductive control and why she can't be 100% on board in terms of um, pro-choice is because of the Mississippi appendectomy experiences that I mentioned earlier in our discussion, right? Because, you know, reproductive uh, justice as um, reproductive freedom, I guess, would be the, the more um, precise phrase at that point. Reproductive freedom for Hamer um, was really concerning. She worried that it would devolve into reproductive control in places like Mississippi. And so she spoke that um, kind of truth to power during that meeting. Um, and she also, you know, brought with her to that founding meeting, um, Gussie Mae Love, who was uh, the mother of a young teen in the Mississippi Delta, a young Black woman who um, was carelessly uh, murdered outside of a grocery store on her graduation day by drunken white teens who were driving by. It was this horrific event that had happened and she brought Gussie Mae Love with her to the founding of the National Women's Political Caucus and said, your oppression has never been like ours. And she pointed out that um, you know Gussie Mae Love was there as a, a, a living example of the white supremacist terror um, that black people were living through uh, in the South in 1971. Right. Well, thank you for that uh, uh, description of sort of some of her work with, with that caucus. Megan, her final years were difficult for her and her family, I read. Um, she seemed, uh, well, they were often without enough funds to live comfortably. Um, and uh, I sort of got the sense that they were, they were sa somewhat sad, uh, her, her later years, although she kept doing things to help people congregated to her to get help and she offered what she could but I just got a sense of she was tired worn out uh, for good reason um, and it was just uh, you know in the lower class of Americans uh, th those times in your life are hard and I got that sense her death on March 14th 1977 um, well her, her funeral uh, draw uh, drew a large crowd and she was eulogized by Jimmy Carter's ambassador to the UN, Andrew Young, who's appeared in the story before. And he said this at the end, quote, thank you for the inspiration. Thank you for the example. Thank you for so strengthening our lives that we might live so God can use us anytime, anywhere, close quote. That phrase, so God can use us, that seems like an, a very good description of, of Fannie Lou Hamer and what she did as she saw it. I think she would agree that she did um, she did things uh, as an instrument in, in God's hands. I think that's probably an accurate way of how she might put it. Um, can, as we conclude, Megan, uh, do you want to share with us any lessons or takeaways from the book, either in terms of important historical transformations you have charted or in terms of helping us understand our present moment? And I should say, we could go on and on with this interview. There's much that we missed and skipped. Um, but I would just encourage listeners to go check out a book on uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, look at uh, some of which were written by Megan, um, and, and get to know her, listen to her speeches and songs. You can find them on the internet and get to know this woman who did much with little to affect the American narrative. So, Megan. Yeah, I mean, I th I think that Hamer, the lesson of lessons from Hamer's life um, are manifold, but I think thinking about um, this idea that there are wells of wisdom upon which to draw, right? That Hamer's creative approaches to problem solving, her um, view that freedom was a constant struggle, right? And after the victories like uh, the 1965 Voting Rights um, Act, for example, she was still working to 
build a poverty program in her community. Freedom Farm Cooperative was something um, that she invested so much time, money, energy, um, and creative problem-solving thought uh, into. So there are many stories from her life that I think could inform our approaches to activism uh, in our contemporary context, activism and organizing. Um, and then certainly the way that her faith informed her approach to um, activism. It was complex, right? She really drew upon um, her astounding um, in-depth knowledge of the Bible and connected that with her lived experiences in profound ways that I think um, your listeners would could learn a lot more um, from. So yes, I will just um, second uh, your, your encouragement that um, readers, the listeners continue to learn about Fannie Lou Hamer through, through books, um, through websites, um, through other sources that are available. Thank you. We have been talking with Megan Parker Brooks, Associate Professor in the Department of Civic Communication and Media at Willamette University and author of several books and other media about the life and times of Fannie Lou Hamer, including Fannie Lou Hamer, America's Freedom Fighting Woman, and the children's book Planting Seeds, The Life and Legacy of Fannie Lou Hamer. Here at the conclusion of this episode, we trust that listeners now understand more about what religion has done to America and what America has done to religion and have a deeper appreciation of religious freedom as a governing principle in the United States, seeing to its protection as an indispensable part of the fragile American experiment in self-government. Don't forget to visit storyofamericanreligion.org and register for future podcast notifications under the sign-up tab. Megan, thank you so much for being with us, and thank you even more than that for doing all the hard work that you did in understanding uh, this person, Fannie Lou Hamer, and getting the word out to us via books and other, other sources. It's been very enlightening, and I hope you've enjoyed the time with us as well. Yeah, thank you for having me. Religion in the American Experience is a project of the National Museum of American Religion. Episodes are released each Monday on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Register for notifications on our website, www.storyofamericanreligion.org, under the sign-up tab. <laughs>